Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, this is the uh, lecture that I am recording for Tuesday, the 17th of April, and Thursday, the 19th of April. So if you are in ES2070, which is engineering surveying, the material on this lecture is in Chapter 22. If you're in ES2670 Practical Surveying, this material is from Chapter 12. So even though it's one lecture uh, for ES2070, this covers two days. And there will be homework at the end that will be due later in the semester. And then we'll do a public or we'll do a, a handout on the public land survey system in sort of the nuts and bolts of subdividing. If any of you have had civil drafting, uh, you may already be familiar with this material, but this is important. Uh, this is important understanding of how our country uh, was formed and how things have changed over the course of time. So to get started, uh, what is the public land survey system? Well, first of all, I'm going to just flip my picture off here. There we go. Um, the this is this map of the United States. Uh, first of all, as you can see, omits of Hawaii, but there are states that are shown in light blue: uh, Texas in the west, and then the states along the eastern seaboard, except for Florida. What that refers to is the fact that these states are not uh, public land states. In other words the naming of tracts of land and the division of land is different is done differently as you can probably imagine as you look along the east coast uh, you can see that most of these states that are blue are the oldest states in the union and that the 13 original colonies are all contained within um, within these blue non-public land states that's because they predated the public land survey system. Uh, the state of Texas is in light blue because Texas was uh, originally came into the United States as a separate country, the Republic of Texas. And the boundaries didn't look like the boundaries are now. If you notice this line right here, um, which is the north, the northernmost line in Texas and the southern line of the Oklahoma Panhandle. Um, actually delineated the state uh, due to concerns about whether it was a free state or a slave state um, at the before the Civil War. So this is the northern boundary of uh, where slaves could be held and so they actually gave the panhandle to Oklahoma so that they would not be a free state. Uh, but the original Republic of Texas actually extended up through Colorado um, and into Wyoming a little bit down by Rollins. There's a, a piece that was kind of like a chimney that came up uh, that was part of the Republic of Texas. But for those reasons, those are not uh, public land states. The state of Hawaii is also not on here because it is not a public land state. It came in as a monarchy, really a different country. And, um, and so the land subdivisions are different. But what public lands uh, means, if you if you take a look in your textbooks, uh, you'll see that at one point the United States was actually quite poor after um, the Revolutionary War, and they had a lot of soldiers who needed to be paid, and we were cash poor and land rich. So the first state that came into the Union, and this is arguable, there's some history involved in it, but the first state that came into the Union after the 13 original colonies was Ohio, although it was not officially a state because some documents weren't signed, but it was the first state that came into the Union. Um, and that's sort of where the idea for public lands got started. If you remember, here's another example. When President Lincoln was born in the 1800s, uh, he was born in Illinois, and Illinois was actually a frontier. If you've heard the stories, he was born in a log cabin in the forest. So, uh, you know, we, now we think of this as being sort of Midwest, but even 150 years ago, this was really wilderness frontier to the West. And these states were, you know, the states where we live, um, 
it was really quite wild. Um, Wyoming, Montana were admitted to the United States in the late 1800s. Um, Alaska was admitted in, I believe, 1959. And some of the other states that were late coming into the Union were Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico, Arizona. And uh, Oklahoma, for example, was uh, called Indian Territory for a long, long time. And because of that, uh, it wasn't a state. It was basically a big reservation. So, so those are some of the things that go along with uh, the public lands. So continuing with that, um, a lot of these states were uh, developed for sort of two purposes, mining, um, which includes now oil and gas, and farming or homesteading. So one of the purposes of the public land survey system, the main purpose of the public land survey system was stated as being the orderly disposition of land. So, in other words, they wanted to give land away or sell land um, in an orderly manner, which implies that the states over here were not sold or given away in an orderly manner. Um, Texas has a system that looks quite a bit like our public land survey system, but it's it has a different basis because, as I said, it was a it was its own country. But basically, what happened over here, if if you were a landowner, um, or if you had a claim to land from the United States government, you would survey your own land or have somebody uh, survey it and they would describe it. Because if you think about it in contract law, if you're going to buy something, you have to know what it is you're going to buy. And the seller can only sell to you something that he or she owns. So that's pretty simple if you're buying, you know, a tape measure from the hardware store. Um, here's the tape measure. You give me money and you've bought the, the tape measure. However, if you're talking about land, land boundaries are somewhat um, artificial. So you have to describe exactly what land it is you're going to be selling. Uh, and the owner of the land has to own the land in its entirety in order for the sale to be legal. So for that reason, over here in the East, uh, the way that the land was disposed of or was described so that it could be sold or given away um, is like, it was very strange. It's called meets and bounds descriptions. Meets means measures and bounds mean boundaries. So if you were going to buy a field from a farmer, um, it might say, um, I'm buying the area that starts on the south east corner at the old oak tree and the land that I'm going to buy tends then in a more or less north direction until we reach a stone wall. When we reach the stone wall we turn more or less west and continue along the stone wall until we come to a fence post that's made out of wood at which point we turn to the south more or less and circle back along until we get to the creek and then from the creek tend east, more or less, until we reach the oak tree. And the land that I'm buying is contained within, uh, within that boundary. Well, it's a very interesting way to do land descriptions. But there are two things that happen. One is that land can be left out of, the, of that kind of a survey system. So in other words, if you have a field and there's a vacant field in between, um, and then another field to the north of that, for example, the land in between the two may not belong to anybody and may not actually be described at all. That is referred to as a hiatus. And was, so when a hiatus is a gap where some land is not owned by anybody. That's pretty bad, but even worse is when you have land that two people feel like they have a legitimate claim to. And that's referred to as an overlap. So overlaps are legally worse than hiatuses, but neither of them is a really cool place to be. So when the public land survey system got started, the federal government had one surveyor general and everybody else was a bunch of contractors. But what they did was they laid out a system in order to be able to give land to people in an orderly manner and have the system all connected uh, through a series of control points so that um, 
so that we would eliminate, or not really eliminate, but that was the, that was the attempt. We tr attempted to eliminate overlaps and hiatuses. And one of the problems with the orderly disposition of land is that people didn't claim land in a nice procession from east to west, right? It's so like Ohio was homesteaded, Illinois was homesteaded, Nebraska was homesteaded, Iowa and Missouri were homesteaded, and then gold was found in Northern California, and so then people found the Willamette Valley in Oregon, and they wanted a homestead here, and people start coming across the country um, on the Oregon Trail or on a different trail to be here. Um, as you all know, the LDS Church kind of came across the country with hand carts, settled in Utah, which at the time they were actually running for. This was actually part of Mexico at the time. Um, but this land, the land was not settled, you know, in a nice pattern uh, from east to west. So we need to construct a series of, they're called initial points, that are all very well defined as to where those points are, that are all very well defined in connection to each other, and then survey land from those initial points. So what you'll notice is um, here in Illinois we have something labeled BL, which stands for baseline, and, going, and that runs east and west, and then the third principal meridian. Uh, down here in Oklahoma we have another baseline, and the Indian Principal Meridian. Up here on the Nebraska-Kansas border, we have the baseline that goes along with the Sixth Principal Meridian. Now, the Sixth Principal Meridian uh, was a big homesteading uh, Principal Meridian, and so a lot of the land here in Wyoming, uh, where we live, was actually surveyed from the Sixth Principal. Now, that's a little odd, if you think about it, if you just look at a map and you don't think about what was going on historically, because we are much closer to the Black Hills Meridian and Baseline, and we're also closer to the Wind River Meridian. Uh, we're also um, more close, to, we're also closer to the Baseline Principal Meridian that intersect in southwest Montana. But from a use point of view, these Principal Meridians and their Baselines were put in place for a different reason. The Black Hills Meridian and this is just called the principal meridian. Montana didn't really name it anything, uh, but they were put in for mining claims. The Wind River um, meridian was put in for the Indian Reservation, and since we are basically a homesteading, this half of the state, the eastern half of Wyoming, um, is uh, is was basically founded on homesteading. Uh, the sixth is the one that we use more than the others. But when you look at a map, it's very important that you reference your land from the principal meridian. And it always says which principal meridian. So for example, if you see a land map here, I'll show you some examples um, in the next vlog. But if, if you look at um, the land here, the last part of the name description is always 6 p.m. So that just indicates that we're surveying from this point, the intersection of the baseline and the sixth principal meridian. Now, I've shown you some um, pictures of survey caps from the Prior Mountains right north of us in Montana, and they are surveyed from this principal meridian, so the numbers look a lot different. The numbers of a land description are similar to an address, a physical address. Like if I was going to write you a letter, I would put your name on the top line, and then I would put um, your street address, your city, your town, and your zip code. So it goes from the more, most specific to the most general. Um, there's only one person, maybe with your name, at least at that address, and the address represents something smaller than the city, which represents something smaller than the state, which represents something maybe smaller than the zip code. Kind of depends on, zip code is a little well, that was in addition to the U.S. Postal Service in the 1960s, but it gives you a general area and a numeric code uh, to help trace it down. And that's more or less what um, a, a land description looks like in the public land survey system. But the most important thing for you to remember is that the purpose of the public land survey system was the orderly disposition of land and that when we talk about disposition, what we mean is the sale or gifting of land, and that we wanted to do it in an orderly 
fashion so that there were no overlaps or hiatuses. Now another thing I'd like to point out on the map, the state of Alaska, there's a lot of baselines <clears throat> and there's a lot of meridians. So if you look, um, there's one clear up in the north above the Arctic Circle. There's one over here. There's one over here. There's a couple down here. The first thing to remember is Alaska is huge. This actually doesn't do it justice. If we superimpose it on the rest of the United States, it would cover about a third of the United States in terms of land mass. Um, and the other thing is, is Alaska is very, very new, and a lot of it is still unexplored. So there's a lot of original surveys that are still occurring in Alaska in extremely unpopulated areas. So if you go down um, into the southern part of Alaska, that's really where most of the population is. If you go to the northern part of Alaska, uh, it's pretty desolate to this day. So there's there are original surveying, surveyings being done there. In the lower 48, not so much. So, and once again, Hawaii has its own land, um, a land dividing system. So, as we continue on through the slides, this is a set of chaining pins. And we've talked about the measure of a chain, which, um, excuse me, they're not chaining pins. This is a chain. This is a gunter's chain, or sometimes it's called a surveyor's chain. Um, and what this basically is, is an instrument where each one of the links on these chains is 8 inches long, which is 0.66 feet. There are 100 links in the chain, and you stretch it out um, to measure uh, a total of 66 feet. One chain equals 66 feet. This is how the public land survey system was originally surveyed, and the chain and link are still the base units in the public land survey system, even though we are not using these anymore. But it's also important to note if this link is 8 inches long, you know from our theory of measurement that all you can really measure to is either closer to one end, closer to the other, or closer to the middle. So um, you really can't get closer than 4 inches. So when we do surveys today, when we do resurveys, or we try to recreate what a surveyor did um, back in the day, we do not recorrect it because we have better instrumentation right now. Uh, what we do is, the phrase is, we walk in the footsteps of the original surveyor. So whatever he, and I use he pretty certainly, there were no women surveyors that I'm aware of in the original public land survey system, um, but where, wherever that surveyor walked, even if he did something that was not that accurate, or even if it was incorrect, unless it was blatantly fraudulent, um, we try to recreate his work. We do not improve upon or correct his work. So this picture shows us um, something called a quadrangle map. And a quadrangle, of course, stands for four, quad meaning four. And as you can see from a principal meridian, this is the principal meridian, whatever one, and the baseline, this is the orderly disposition pattern that the public land survey system strove for. Starting with the baseline, um, they built four tiers up and four tiers over, and that creates 16 blocks, which would be, if the world were flat and square and true, um, that would be uh, that would be a perfect square. And of course it's not because the earth is curved and there are rivers and streams and mountains and other obstructions, so uh, there are some, this is an ideal situation. So we divide the layers up into going north, we have one, uh, the first, I guess you would say row, is called Township 1 North. The next row is called Township 2 North and so forth. When you are underneath um, or to the south, because this is a typical map, north is pointing up, when you go south, the first tier south is Township 1 South, Township 2 South, and so forth. Um, and then going to the east or to the west, we refer to these as ranges. So each one of these theoretical squares is identified as its position with its position as some township north or south and some range east or west. So this square right here would be township 2 north, range 3 west. This would be um, township 3 south range 3 west. 
I think I said this wrong. This would be range 3 east. This is township 2 north, range 3 east. Uh, this would be township 3 south, range 3 west. So we're always measuring from that initial point. Now, it tells you on here that you go out 24 miles, and then you have um, meridians. The reason for this is, is because the curvature of the Earth, 24 miles is about all you can go out before you have to make a correction for that curvature. So in a perfect world, if the world were flat, this point and this point would be coincident. This point and this point would be coincident, and these lines would be straight lines that would be parallel or perpendicular to these lines. But because the Earth's curved, we have to correct for that curvature. Um, and CC refers to a closing corner, um, which just means that that's something where one range line does not meet up exactly with the next range line in the next quadrangle. So if you have ever been um, out hunting and you have like a Bureau of Land Management map uh, called a, a quadrangle map, this is what they're referring to. A quadrangle is approximately 24 miles by 24 miles square, and it's really the division that we've decided is as large as you can get without making corrections uh, for the curvature of the Earth. So um, the other part is, is that we call at, at the south end, we call that the first standard parallel south. So 24 miles south of the initial point is the first standard parallel south. 24 miles north is the first standard parallel north. And 24 miles to the west, we have the meridian west and the first guide. This is called the first guide meridian west, even though it's split. And this is called the first guide meridian east. So that's where we take up all of our corrections uh, when we are doing this kind of a survey. All right, now we're not going to get into too much about the actual how these things are corrected. If you take further surveying classes, especially in classes in the public land survey system, um, which you can take at least six credits learning the details of the public land survey system, uh, you'll learn more about these corrections. And this is just a little correction um, algorithm, I guess you would say, a graph to show you how we correct based on um, where we are, where Astronomic North is, and what our true parallels are. Once again, it's not content that we're going to go over in depth in this class, but it's just something what I'd really like you to keep in mind is just to realize that the Earth is not square and true, and that um, everything in the public land survey system is referenced from Astronomic North. So depending on where you are, you may the correction to Astronomic North may be a little different from one place to the other. And this is just another correction factor. Okay, this shows you the order in which um, in which the parallels are run, and it's it's called a random and true um, way of chaining. It has to do with not really knowing where true north is, where astronomic north is, and making corrections as you go along. Um, once again, we're not going to focus on this very much, uh, but we will. Um, just just understand random and true just means correcting for um, actual direction. And this also just tells you a little bit about direction. The, the manual of the Public Land Survey System, which was published, is not published very often, it was published at the time that the Public Land Survey System was originated, and then there have been some updates to it. One was in 1973, the other one was in, I believe, 2001. Um, and it's sort of like the Bible for um, all of the ways that you create surveys, record surveys, and mark surveys, um, and what becomes the hierarchy call. In other words, which types of evidence take precedence over others if you can't um, live in a perfect world. So we can take a look at all of those things in a little bit. Um, I'm looking at my time. And the video here is already 24 minutes long, so I'm going to change my original statement. Um, instead of 
making one long video for this week, I'm going to split this into two. So we've sort of done some basic work uh, on understanding the meaning of the public land survey system. So I'm going to post this video and then I will uh, create another one to kind of get into the nuts and bolts. So um, I'll end this video and start the other one, which would be for the 19th um, and perhaps continue into the 24th of April.